Epistemology of the Closet by Eve Sedgwick. She tries to bridge the gap between theory and practice. In theory, she tries to analyze homoerotic relationships in literary and philosophical history. In practice, by analyzing this, she is calling social and political attention to a systemically marginalized group. She treats the topic homosexual panic in the introduction. The methodology she uses here is deconstruction, the deconstruction of social binaries. Her thesis is that social binaries for example, heterosexual, homosexual, are not constituted by a relation of symmetry but asymmetry. Binaries do not have equals but superior one and the inferior or other one. Heterosexual is the accepted norm while homosexual is the other. The world has been organized to favor heterosexual individuals over homosexual individuals. Chapter 1 Chapter 1 deals with the sexual identity of gay people. In this chapter, she brings in the life of the 8th grade science teacher named Akenfora. He was removed from his teaching position once the school board found out he had been part of a pro-homosexual student group during his college years. Now, the sexual identity of gay people has two facets. One, private life. Two, public life. Here, secrecy or private life is represented by the word closet. And public life is the disclosure of one's homosexual orientation. Remaining in the closet or private allowed for Akenfra's employment. He got the job because he had hidden the fact that he was a homosexual. Coming out from this closet or exposing his identity gave the Board of Education legal means to bar him from teaching in the classroom for no other reason than his homosexuality being a piece of public knowledge. Now, there is the double bind structure of homosexuality. If one remained in the closet, then there was a danger of being found out. But coming out of the closet resulted in exposure to depression. There will be a lot of setbacks if one revealed his own identity as a homosexual. Chapter 2 brings in Melville's Billy Budd. Billy Budd has three main characters, Clogart, a gay policeman, Billy, the seaman, Vere, the ship captain. Billy's suspicion and hostility towards Clogart is focused. Billy has suspicion regarding Clogart's moral character. The mutinies in other ships adds to his suspicion. Clogart is impossible to read or to understand. In the end, during the interrogation, Billy finds himself speechless and kills Clogart. This story is relevant to Sedgwick's investigation because the stereotype of opacity and secrecy in homosexual identity and desire is heightened by Clogart's status as a policeman and by the background events of recent mutinies on other ships. For Sedgwick, the connection of Melville's story of homosexual life is that it is constitutive of heteronormative masculinity and heteronormative male-male relations. Heterosexual men are compelled to continuously police their desires and the desires of the others even to the extent of unfounded suspicion that verges on madness, as depicted in Billy's murder of Clogart. Chapter 3 In Chapter 3, Sedgwick underscores the way in which homophobic anxieties have come to be embedded at the heart of heterosexual identity during the end of 1800s. 
and through the work of Oscar Wilde and Frederick Nietzsche. According to Sedgwick, both Wilde and Nietzsche carried out a revaluation of the status of heterosexual masculinity in light of the German and English attitude towards ancient Greek art. The reception of Greek art during Romantic period served as an occasion for a general societal acceptance of unphobic enjoyment of male figure. However, new divisions and lines were drawn between heterosexual and homosexual life, and heterosexuality was able to secure its non-homosexual status through measured displays of affection or sentimentality. Wilde's characters and the homosexual bonds that undergird much of Nietzsche's writing both serve as testament to the fact that romantic ideal of heterosexual masculinity allowed for a greater degree of traditionally feminine homosexual behaviors while re-establishing the boundary between heterosexual and homosexual by virtue of the heterosexual's distance from desire itself within their public and private life. Chapter 4 Chapter 4 brings in Victorian and Gothic literature, another shift in the heterosexual-homosexual binary. According to Sedgwick, in Gothic literature, male hero was presented as tenacious to the point of martyrdom, and in Victorian literature, the male hero was presented as isolated, aloof, and defined by lack of desire. This shift happened because during the Victorian era, the lines between heterosexual and homosexual life recast such that heterosexual masculinity came to be defined by the singular trait of aloof detachment from the whole of social life. In other words, homosexuality secured its non-homosexual status precisely by rejecting occasions for desire relation or attachment to take hold. Chapter 5 The Other Side of the Spectrum It throws light on the other side. Here the work that is brought in is Proust's In Search of Lost Time. Here Sedgwick focuses on the two characters who are queer. The key insight from this chapter is that the way in which Proust's narrator describes Charles and Albertine as different in every relevant way except one. Regardless of the suspicion surrounding Charles' true sex and Albertine's sexuality, both figures are cast as inhabiting a feminine position relative to the world of the text as a whole. In other words, what becomes tied to the heteronormality is not femininity but masculinity, and homophobic dynamics are doubled by patriarchal relations of power.